Well, good evening. Good evening. I'm getting all excited. I looked. So, wow, I'm going to have about 45 minutes or 40 minutes. And then Deborah Palmer busted my bubble. She said, oh, you, you only got 20 minutes. That's it. <laughs> oh, my. You know, the favorite, one of my favorite times in the service is, is when we sing. It's, I don't know, just does something for me. Um, I get excited about just good gospel music. And um, one of my favorite songs is Sweet Hour of Prayer. And I'm just going to read a couple of verses of this. And while I'm doing that, if you'll turn to Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6, that's going to be the scripture we're going to use tonight. When we talk about Sweet Hour of Prayer, um, that is the subject for tonight. I also want to talk about the results of a dynamic prayer life. Here's the sweet hour of prayer and, and uh, how it goes. It says, sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer that calls me from a world of care and bids me at my Father's throne make all my wants and wishes known. In seasons of distress and grief, my soul has often found relief and oft escaped the tempter snare by thy return, sweet hour of prayer. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer, may I thy consolation share, till from Mount Pisgah's lofty height I view my home and take my flight. In my immortal flesh I'll rise to seize the everlasting prize and shout while passing through the air, farewell, farewell, sweet hour of prayer. The scripture I want to use tonight is from like I said, Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, and it simply says this. It says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. Lord, we're grateful that we can come to the King of the universe, the creator of all things, to bring our petitions and our prayer requests, knowing that you will hear and you care for us. Lord, I thank you for each one that is here tonight. Father, just place them in your hand and ask that you would be with them. Uh, Lord, for those who could not be here, think of Brother Brian. I pray that uh, you would be with him as he's on the mend and uh, just bless him. Lord, I pray for those that do not know you. Father, that, that you will draw them close to you. I pray today, Father, that they would come to know you in this hour. Lord, thank you for your great love. Thank you for Jesus who died for each of us so that we might have eternal life. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray these things. Amen. Amen. One of the greatest things that you and I could ever learn is to view prayer from God's perspective. We will never fully understand prayer until we grasp God's primary purposes for prayer. Prayer is far more than God just meeting our needs, but prayer is God's primary means of us worshiping Him and experiencing transformation through the indwelling Christ. It is through prayer and Scripture that God is preparing believers such as us for the great wedding which is soon to come. And that wedding, I believe, is going to be sooner than most people think that it is. It's just right around the corner. Prayer is not about what you can get out of God, but rather what He purposes to do in and through us for His own pleasure. Prayer is, a major, is the major way that we come to know Him and to hear His voice. It is through prayer that Christ purifies His bride, the church, and builds His kingdom. The great secret Ready for this? The great secret of prayer is to align ourselves to God's purposes rather than seeking to align Him to ours. It's all about Him. One of the greatest desires, one of the greatest desires uh, that God has is for you and I to develop a powerful and dynamic prayer life. So I've titled this message, This is the Result of a Dynamic Prayer Life. Many times we'll go through and say, all right, this is point one, two, three, four, and this is the end result. Well, today I want to share with you that hopefully you have a dynamic prayer life, and these are some of the benefits 
that you and I are able to enjoy. And we see that they are really four God-ordained results of having a powerful and biblical prayer life. All right? So number one, if you're having and you are able to experience that particular prayer life, you'll see that your relationship with him will become much more personal and real. Matthew 22 tells us that the believer's greatest priority is to personally know him and to love him with all of our heart. And above anything, above anything, God desires to have a personal and intimate relationship with you and I. But it is impossible to have that close relationship with him without spending an adequate amount of time in prayer. Think about the times as we, as we spend that time in prayer with the Lord and we begin to draw closer to him, certain things will happen. First of all, he's going to lead us in the way that we need to go. Many of us each day think about the houses we need to buy, the jobs we need to have, the cars we need to drive for younger people, the spouses. We get to a fork in the road. Many of us have been that way. Which way do I go, Lord? Which way do I go? And he will show us as we grow close to him and we talk to him, he will show us the way that we need to go. I think back in the Old Testament where Moses was leading the nation of Israel out of Egypt. And they came out and they actually got, they were trying to figure out which way to go. Well, the shortest distance between Egypt and the Promised Land was to go through the land of the Philistines. But you know what? God didn't take the nation of Israel through the land of the Philistines. He went way out around by way of the wilderness. Well, why would you not take the short way? Well, God was still trying to accomplish his purpose. And he knew that if he took the nation of Israel through the midst of the land of the Philistines and they saw the war and the violence that was going on, they would turn around and they would go back to Egypt. And that's not what he wanted. He wanted them to move forward going to the promised land. That was the best thing. You know, there's probably different things or different ways he could have gone, but you know what? God provided for them the very best way. He provided the way that would accomplish the purpose that he had for them. And it's the same way with us today. God wants to lead us the best way, the very best way, if we'll listen to what he has to say. You know, which way do we need to go? Should it go this way or that way? God wants to provide for us the very best if we'll just listen to him. You know, there are several different ways that we can go in life, but God's way is the best way, and that's what we ought to want, the best way. He not only leads us, but he'll continue to provide for us. He probably, the Bible tells us that, I, the Bible says that I will provide all of your needs according to my riches and glory in Christ Jesus. You know, we need to claim that promise every day, that he'll supply not just a few, just not one or two, the Bible says that he will supply all, everything that we need to accomplish what he has for us, he will provide for us. And we see that not only will he lead and provide, but he protects us. He protects us every day. Sometimes you wonder where he's at. We wonder what he's doing in, in times of emergency or chaos. Where is he at? Where is God? Well, he's there. He's protecting you each and every day. Think back into the book of Exodus when um, they had the, the nation of Israel had come up to the Red Sea. And I don't know if you all are familiar with that. I know you are. But I want to read just a couple of, of scripture that has to do with protection. And I want you to know that in this particular scripture, in Exodus chapter 14, God had you and me on his heart and on his mind even way back then at the crossing of the Red Sea. Here's what the Bible has to say. It says, The angel of God who had been going before the camp of Israel moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them. So it came between the camp of Egypt and the camp of Israel. And there was a cloud along with the darkness, yet it gave light at night. Thus one did not come near the other all night long. I had to, when I thought about this scripture and read it, I had to draw myself out a map and try to figure out who's going where, all right? So I think here's the Red Sea. Here's the angel of God. Here's the nation of Israel. 
and here's Egypt. Pharaoh and his army now had run all the way, had been chasing them, seemed like forever. Got them all the way to the Red Sea. Where were we at? What was going to happen to the nation of Israel? Pharaoh's purpose was to run them into the sea, run them into the water, and they will be done forever and ever. There would be no more of them. Question. How is it that God had you and me on his mind in this particular instance? This is over, what, 2,000 years ago? I wasn't here. Y'all weren't here. How could it be that he was thinking of me and thinking of you? Think of it like this as you start to read and study the Scripture. If Pharaoh would have had his way and ran the entire nation of Israel into the Red Sea and exterminated everybody... How many Jews would have been left? No Jews, right? None of the Jewish people. Question number two. What lineage did Jesus come from? How could Jesus come about if there were no Jews? Had Had a lady tell me one time, well, God would have just done something else. Wrong answer. The God I serve makes no mistakes. It wasn't. It wasn't a mistake that they ran them all in. Listen, he was setting it up where he could have the glory. So we see that Pharaoh wanted to run the Jewish people into the midst of the Red Sea. There would be no more. Jesus was a Jew. Well, guess what? If there were no more Jews and there, were, there was no Jesus, there would have been no virgin birth. If there was no virgin birth, there would have been no cross. Or death on the cross. If there's no death on the cross, there'd been no burial in the tomb. If there was no burial in the tomb, there would have been no resurrection. And if there's no resurrection, there's no hope for you and me today. You think God wasn't thinking about you over 2,000 years ago? He was protecting you, and none of us were even here yet. But he foreknew long, long ago that you and I would need a Savior. And that we would need to be saved from our sins. And he protected you and me all the way back then at the Red Sea. He also wants us to partner with him. He's right here. He never asks us to do anything by ourselves. We can always partner with him. He's going to enable you and empower you to do the work that he has for you. It's through prayer that God purposes to establish and deepen the relationship that he has with each one of us. Number two, if you have that dynamic prayer life, your ability to clearly hear God's voice will dramatically increase. It will dramatically increase. Jeremiah 29 tells us this, you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. God clearly promises his direction and spiritual wisdom to those who earnestly seek him out. Jesus simply said, my sheep will know my voice. I think that's pretty amazing when I think Ernie and Becky and Ren and I, we've had in the last 14 months, we've had a great grandchild and another grandchild that, well, I guess Emerson's what, 14 months? And Bella's only two months, two months today, in fact. Here's the amazing thing. Those children at that very, very young age, especially Bella being just two months old, you know what, I can go in and talk to her. Renda can go in and talk to her, and that's good. But you let her mom and daddy go in and talk to her, and guess what? That head starts turning, and she's trying to find them. She recognizes their voice, and the reason that she recognizes their voice is because they provide for her, they feed her, they protect her, they uh, do many, many things for her, and they watch over her constantly. She is already used to their care. So we think about the little babies hearing the voice of the parents. It's no different with our Heavenly Father. You know what? If we're spending enough time with Him, guess what? We are going to be able to distinguish. We're going to be able to discern His voice when He talks to us. 
Very simply put, if a follower of Christ is willing to eagerly and consistently seek the face of God, you know what's going to happen? He's going to find him. He's going to find him if we'll just seek him. If we're not willing to spend an adequate amount of time in uninterrupted prayer, God's small, quiet voice will be difficult for you and I to discern. In fact, so let me say this, in fact, much, without much time in regular prayer, you and I are going to become spiritually hard of hearing. We'll not be able to hear what the Lord says when he speaks to us. So we must be able to put ourselves in a position where we spend time in prayer and we're able to be able to hear his voice and know it when he's speaking to us. Number three, we will experience, if we have a dynamic prayer life, we will experience far greater power to withstand trials, <laughs> temptations, and spiritual attacks. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 says this, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and we are taking every thought Captive to the obedience of Christ. Hmm. Spiritual warfare, actually, it's the essential way that we do spiritual warfare, through prayer. When our prayer life is weak, guess what? Our defenses are going to be down and we're going to be weak. When we don't take the time to pray daily, we are more vulnerable to sin we're more vulnerable to Satan. We're more vulnerable to the worldliness that is around us. The flip side of that coin is when we're consistent in our prayer life, we will, um, we will have a greater ability to overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil. Now, if I were to join the military, I'm not, but it just... If I was, and I were to go to Afghanistan, do you think I would go dressed like this? No. If I'm going to Afghanistan, guess what? I'm going to get me a helmet on. <laughs> I'm going to get me a set of fatigues on with the boots. I'm going to get a bulletproof vest. I'm going to get a rifle. I'm going to get the ammo, the belts, the hand grenades, the whole nine yards to go into battle and to fight. What's the difference between us going to a place like Afghanistan and us doing spiritual warfare every day? Every day. Listen, God expects us to put on the full armor of God. Put on the full armor. Girding our loins with the truth. Putting on the breastplate of righteousness. Shot in our feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace taking up the shield of faith, putting on the helmet of salvation, and take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Five of those six, five of them, are things that we can use to defend ourselves. Helmet of salvation, the shield of faith, girding our loins with the truth, those things. We can defend ourselves with it, but it's the last one. It's picking up the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God that gives us an offensive weapon that we can attack the devil with. We can attack him, and guess what? What does the Bible tell us? In James it says, Submit therefore to God, re, um, submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will do what? He will flee from us. Pick up the sword of the Spirit and end up do that each and every day, each and every day. Finally, we see that we can experience a dynamic prayer life, and the last thing we'll do, and most people are interested in this one, all right? If we have that dynamic prayer life, we will see ex or experience a significant answer to prayer. A significant answer to prayer. John 15 tells us, if you abide in me and my words... 
And my words abide in you. Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Wow. Be so close to God that you can ask, and it will be done for you. That is amazing. If we're going to do that, though, we must pray with perseverance. Pray with perseverance. What did Jesus mean when he told his followers to seek and to knock? Well, he was just simply inviting um, us as believers to approach our Heavenly Father freely with our petitions. You can freely come to the Lord anytime, any day, bring your petitions and your requests to him, and we can fully expect him to provide all that we need, all that we need. However... However, he never promised that every door would be opened immediately. Not every door is going to be opened immediately. On the contrary, in telling us to seek and deny, Jesus used a Greek verb form called present imperative. But y'all didn't think I knew a word like that, did you? Well, you know what? I didn't. I had to go look it up to find out. <laughs> Way back in grade school when they were teaching, I had to find out exactly what it meant. Well, think about it. These two verbs are translated as knock and keep knocking. When you go to a neighbor's house, you knock just one time, figure they're not at home, and turn around and leave? Absolutely not. Keep knocking. Keep knocking until somebody answers the door, till somebody comes to the door, whoever it is that you might be there to see. But the verb is, con is translated as knock and keep on knocking until you get an answer. Listen, how many times, don't anybody raise their hand, how many times have some, has somebody asked you to pray for them? We pray one time and forget it. How many in our own life request for our own prayer requests? Do we not, or do we ask one time, and then we forget about it, and we dismiss it? We need to keep on knocking. It translates also as to seek, and keep on seeking. Keep seeking till you find what it is that you're looking for. In other words, perseverance Perseverance is a vital aspect of answered prayer. But some gifts, some gifts God has for us come only after long seasons of praying and waiting. I think of Abraham in the Old Testament. He asked God for a son, did he not? Absolutely. And how long did Abraham have to wait before God gave him a son. 25 years. 25 years Abraham waited for a son. That's a long time. I can't imagine, I really can't, trying to pray about the same thing for 25 years. Some people have trouble praying just 25 minutes. Much less 25 years. But that God was faithful. He was faithful. It's important to understand that our Heavenly Father delights in responding to our prayers. He wants to respond to them, and you know what? He responds to them in three different ways, and I think we're probably all familiar with these. The first way he responds to our prayers is yes. Yes, immediately or maybe within a short period of time. And that's good because when he answers our prayers that quickly it motivates us to know and to trust him more and God opens our eyes as to how faithful he is and when we bring the little things to him and he answers right away guess what that motivates us and encourages us to bring what the bigger things to him the bigger things in life we can come to him in confidence being assured that he is going to answer our prayers secondly two and three go pretty close together number two is that he will answer and say wait just wait we may be asking for the right thing 
We may be asking for the right thing, but we're not quite prepared to receive his answer. He may be quietly arranging the circumstances in behind the scenes before granting our request. Whenever we sense that the Lord is telling us to wait, it may be a good, a good idea for us to take a look on the inside, on the inside of ourselves to examine, do a self-examination. I think of uh, Psalm, let me look, get it here right quick, Psalm 139. Psalm 139 simply says this, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me. Try me and know my anxious thoughts and see if there be any hurtful way in me and lead me in the everlasting way. If we ask God to reveal to us any wrong motives or incorrect perspectives that might be hindering his answer, guess what? You think he's going to show you what it is? Yes, he is. He's going to show you. God is always faithful to let us know to let us know anything that might be hindering his answer. Persevering in prayer gives our Father the opportunity to work within us and work within our circumstances that we're going through at that particular time. The third way that the Lord might answer, yes, wait. I bet you're all thinking, no. No, nah. you've got to be positive. Be positive. Listen, God will either answer yes, wait, or I have something better for you. I have something better. Sounds like no, but our Father knows our needs. He knows our desires, and he truly wants to meet them. He promises to give only what is good. Only what is good. And this means sometimes he will withhold what we want if it's not the best thing for our life. He will hold it back. You know, most of us can probably look back on things that we've asked God, and we can be grateful that God did not grant some of the things that we asked him. I know I do. Nonetheless, guess what? We should keep praying. We need to keep praying until what? Until we get an answer. And at the right time, the Lord is going to meet our desires in a most satisfying, in the most satisfying way possible. When God has us wait, guess what? He always has a purpose for making us wait. I think about the story of uh, Mary and Martha and how they were waiting uh, with Lazarus while Lazarus was dying. And what, what happened? They sent word to Jesus to come quickly because Lazarus was dying. Now, Jesus ended up, he had many meals, in their home, been in their home several times. And I can just imagine when Jesus got the word from Mary and Martha to, to hurry and come because Lazarus was dying. Can you just imagine Jesus? He was, he was fine. He was all right with that. He wasn't upset that Lazarus was passing away. The sisters expected Jesus to come quickly when they heard that, when Jesus heard that Lazarus was at the point of death. Instead, he waited. He waited until their brother had died or passed away. At first, Jesus' delay did not seem good to Mary and to Martha. But we see, what is the end result? What was the end result at that time? Listen, the Savior did something better. He did something that better than heal Lazarus. He raised him from the dead. And guess what? We today are still talking about the miracle of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead that proved Jesus' power over death. Folks, I'm glad that he waited so people back then would know we need to know that Jesus has power over death. It's always best. It's always best to wait on God's perfect timing. We need to pray with perseverance. We need to pray with confidence. 
Confidence in prayer is belief in the trustworthiness of God. We must trust that he is going to provide all of our needs. And he, Jesus ends up illustrating this when he says, when he referred to a typical relationship between a father and a son. He said, a parent would not give a child a stone if he were asked for bread, nor would he give a snake when asked for a fish in a similar way, in a similar way. Our Heavenly Father can be trusted to give us gifts that are beneficial in every way. Beneficial to us each and every time. Sometimes people pray, pray for something and they're determined to get it whether or not God gives it to them or not. They become impatient. Impatient. And they run ahead of God and make a big, big mistake of trying to get what they want on their own. I'm going to get it regardless of what it costs or who it costs. When we constantly, when we're constantly abiding in Christ, our prayers will take on a far greater power and will be much more effective. You will also be aware that there are more answers to your prayers. If you haven't heard anything else I've said, please listen as I share this with you. It is only through the cleansing process of the Holy Spirit that our prayers have enormous power to move mountains. It is through adequate time and prayer that we are able to maintain total cleansing and the filling of the Holy Spirit. Failure. Failure to spend time confessing and cleansing ourselves through daily prayer time is the primary reason why many believers see few of their prayers answered. The Bible tells us in Psalm 66, David says, If I regard wickedness in my heart, the Lord will not hear. Isaiah 59 Behold, the Lord's hand is not so short that it cannot save, but your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. You know, there's many, many, many other benefits to a dynamic prayer life than these four. I could stand up here till the cows come home and tell you and share with you different benefits. But I felt that these were, these were really some of the more important ones. Without a doubt, without a doubt, a prayerful life will change your relationship with God. In fact, your prayer life is your relationship with God. God uses common, ordinary people who have learned to abide in Christ through serious daily prayer. Everything, everything revolves around a close prayer relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. No matter how big or how little your task is, no matter how devastating your circumstances are, or your problems are, no matter what your circumstances are. You know what? Significant prayer is the absolute key to a miraculous new walk with Christ. Folks, I put myself at the top of the list. I, I spend time in prayer, but not as much as I should. I need to spend more time talking to our Heavenly Father. So, I'm going to do an invitation. It's, it's a little bit, everybody just remain seated. It's, it's going to be a different type of invitation. Gary, come on up. Come on up. Got a little deal that Gary's going to do for me here. What I want to do is give you all, it, it's just, it's really just a small test in math, okay? Everybody pretty good at math? Don't need, no. <laughs> everybody's shaking their What I'm going to have you do for the invitation is simply this. I want you to pick a number. All right? Now, 
piece of advice. Don't pick a number that's five, six, seven, eight digits long. Pick out something simple because we're going to ask you to do some math in your head. All right? All right? All right. Everybody just, just pick a number. All right? Everybody got a number? Double it. Add 10 more to it. Divide it by two or cut it in half. Subtract the number that you had originally picked. You notice I haven't come close to this sheet, right? Gary, flip that sheet over and see if this is your number. Thank you, Gary. Appreciate it. Say that to say this. All of us have different sin, do we not? That's number. Everybody picked a different number. Didn't ask you to tell anybody what the number was. Just pick a number. So everybody picks a different number. Through the formula that I gave to you, I asked you to do the math. Guess what? You were able to arrive at an answer. And I already knew what the answer was before you ever picked a number. We have many different sins in life. My sin is not the same as your sin. All right? God furnished the means, the vehicle called the Holy Spirit to share with us, he was the, the Holy Spirit is the formula so that we are able to determine what the one answer is. And he tells us that Jesus Christ is the answer. Many sin, the formula from the Holy Spirit tells us that it's Jesus. He is the answer. You know, think about it. You know, God wants us to have an abundant life. He wants us to have eternal life. Guess what? There's a problem. There is a problem. We talked about it here just a minute ago. The sin in my life, in our lives, have separated us from the love of God. That's a big problem. So the question is, how is it? I have a desire to go to heaven. You have a desire to go to heaven. How's that going to happen? Well, God tells us that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's a problem. God also tells us that the wages of sin is death. If you go to the bank and you take out a loan, guess what? That bank demands that you pay that money back, right? Guess what? God demands that there's a payment for our sin. The wages of sin is death. God tells us also that as appointed unto man wants to die. And then the judgment. So what is it that we're going to do? How do we do that? What is the remedy? What is the solution that God has given to us? Well, the Bible tells us, For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that, he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh and been made alive in the spirit. Jesus is the solution. He's the one answer. There is no other answer. All the sins of all mankind can be forgiven by one person, Jesus Christ. The remedy. God demonstrated his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For by grace are you saved through faith, and not that of yourselves. It's a gift of God. Not by works, not how good we are, lest any man should boast. Hmm. Christ is the answer for all sin. For all the problems that we've seen through the ages in the world today, Christ is the only answer answer so how do we respond how should we respond to that 
Well, the Bible tells us, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, even those who believe on his name. It's a decision that we have to make. It's a decision. The Bible also tells us that if we'll confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that he raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You will be saved, for with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth confesses, resulting in salvation. Nobody can make you receive Christ. It's an individual decision. But I want to share with you tonight, as most people already here know, Christ is the answer. Just like the math problem with all the numbers, it all boils down to one number. All of our sins, all the evil in the world, all the evil that we see, all boils down to the fact that God has given us a Savior. One Savior who is able to forgive sins, cleanse us. He said, if we confess with our mouth, Jesus is Lord, he's going to do what? He's going to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. How amazing that is that he would be willing, he thinks enough of you and enough of myself to die on the cross to pay my sin debt. Folks, we ought to be rejoicing and getting on our knees and praying each and every day, just thanking him for all that he's done. Sweet hour of prayer. Let me encourage you to spend more time in prayer. If you're not already, spend more time there. It's amazing the results that you'll get. Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for the power and the truth of prayer. We thank you, Lord, that you are with us. You are inside of us. And you're willing to answer our prayer if we will come to you and just be truthful. Thank you, Father, for loving us unconditionally. Lord, thank you for protecting us and thinking of us all the way back to the time of the Red Sea. We were already on your heart. We were already on your mind. You already knew that we would need a Savior, and you provided that for us, that we could take advantage of that 2,000 years later. Thank you, Father, for all that you do, for it's in Jesus' name that we ask these things. Amen.